there are 2,350 verses in the Bible about money. How, is, how can that be? 2,350 verses. And like I said, money is not bad, but loving money is. Trusting money is. Valuing money more than you value God is. Making an idol of money, and an idol is based on the value you assign to it more than God. Have you assigned a value to money more than God? Do you trust that money can take care of you when God is saying, please give me a shot? I got you, but you have valued money. You have placed a value on money greater than God. Money is like a hammer. It can help or it can hurt. Somebody says, all right, Pastor Dollar, I'm hearing you, but how do I know if I have the love of money? If I got the love of money, I need to know whether or not I have the love of money or not. I need to understand whether or not I have the love of money. Can I give you some practical things? It's going to sting a little bit, right? It's going to sting a little bit, right? People freaking out. They hate the fact that I even use the word money. Watch this. Let me give you some things to check your life out. Evidence that you have the love of money. You let a paycheck direct, you let a paycheck direct your decisions rather than God. Number two. Money makes you anxious and fearful. Money makes you anxious and fearful. Number three, when you are obsessive about building wealth, you have a love for money. Number four, this is the most obvious one, you've cheated, you've lied, and you've stolen to get wealth. You've cheated, you've lied, and you've stolen to get wealth. Number five, you feel stingy. Why are you laughing? <laughs> Number six, you, you, you don't give offerings. There you go. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus ain't never said nothing and had, Jesus ain't never said nothing about no offering, and Jesus ain't never had nothing to do with no offering. Oh, I beg to differ. In fact, I'm going to show you a scripture right now where he sat right there in the middle of church and watched people as they gave an offering and made a comment. Go to Mark chapter 12, 41 through 44. Mark 12, 41 through 44. Let's look at it in the, uh, yeah, King James. And Jesus sat over against the treasury, and he beheld how people cast money into the treasury. Who, who, who beheld it? Who was looking? And you, you get offended if your neighbor look at you while you're giving. Don't be looking at what I'm giving. It ain't none of your business. <laughs> Jesus was looking into the treasury to see how they were giving. And he said, and many that were rich, they cast in much. And there came a certain poor woman, widow, and she threw in two mites, which make a farthing. And, and he called unto him, his disciples, and saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that this poor widow woman hath cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. For all they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. Now, look at this in the NLT. So, I mean, so people go around talking about, well, Jesus, you know, he never had nothing to say about this. Jesus sat down near the collection box. My God, that's messing up your religion, right? 
Now, right about now, you might be saying, hmm, is he trying to trick me? Trick me? Can't you read? Jesus sat down near the collection box. See, what's happening right now, you're trying to figure out, do I preserve my traditional belief about money or am I going to change? See, what you got to understand is you have to be careful not to change the Bible. You got to let the Bible change your thinking. And some people are not ready for that to happen. I always thought like that. My grandmama and them told me that. And bless God, uh, uh, Creflo and Tiffy ain't going to change my mind about nothing. <laughs> if you hang on with me today, I'm going to show you there's a demon behind all of this. There's a devil that's been working for centuries in this country. Jesus sat down near the collection box in the temple, and he watched as the crowds dropped in their money. How many of you know Jesus is still watching? Many rich people put in large amounts. Then a poor widow came and dropped in two small coins. Jesus called his disciples to him and said, come here, come here, come here, come here, come here. I need y'all to see this. So now you got his disciples looking at it. He said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has given more than all the others who are making contributions, large contributions. For they gave a tiny part of their surplus. It was a big offering to that temple, but it was a small part of the surplus. But she, poor as she is, has given everything she had to live on. Listen to me carefully. When you pursue security and comfort over God's plans and purposes for your life, you have a love of money. Money for Christian people should be attracted, not pursued. So you've been listening to too much of them, them, them power speakers. They're teaching you to pursue something that you should be attracting. Yeah. I, now, follow me. Follow me. I'm about there. The moment you start pursuing money, it becomes a spirit of mammon that's motivating you. The moment you start pursuing mammon, or excuse me, money, a spirit of mammon, a spirit of mammon, you become a part of a spirit of mammon. Mm. And I don't know nobody in this nation, well, almost, almost every entity in this nation is mammon-driven. It's about the bag. It ain't about caring for you, it's about the bag. The motivation behind what most entities are motivated to do, I won't say all of them, but most of them, is this spirit of mammon. Now, let's deal with this. Mammon is an Aramaic word meaning riches. And at the heart, there's an attitude that says, at the heart of this, that man doesn't need God, that we're self-sufficient. This is what the spirit of mammon tries to tell us. You don't need God. Trust in money. That's what the spirit of mammon, it is a demon. It is demonic influence. You don't need God. Trust in the money. Mammon was the name of the Syrian god of riches and money. There was a false god that was called Mammon, and it was the Syrian god of riches and money. And in Revelations chapter 18, the city of Babylon shows a city or a world given over to the spirit of mammon. It shows a world, a city that was possessed by the spirit of mammon with all of its greed and avarice, an unhealthy relationship and trust with the material world. That's what Bab Babylon showed. Now, 
prophetically speaking, of what is to come in these last days. As I analyze Revelation 17, verse 1, through Revelation chapter 19, verse 4, I kept seeing Babylon the Great. And it was prophesying a rebirth of Babylon the Great. The first one, I think, was located in Iran, Babylon the Great. That city failed. It's not making reference to that coming back again. But I want to read to you the characteristics of this new Babylon the Great. And you make your own decision. The identification of Babylon the Great was identified as the great world superpower of the end times. Babylon the Great has the largest economy of any entity in the world. It is the center of wealth in the world, and it is responsible for an extended period of global wealth creation in the end times. Babylon the Great has shaped global culture in the end times. In a directly anti-Christian manner, it shaped global culture. Stuff that came out of Babylon the Great seemed to spread around the world. Babylon the Great has the greatest political power of any entity in the end times. Babylon the Great is considered to have the strongest military in the world of the end times. I don't know, help me, but all of these characteristics uniquely and definitively match the United States. And another part of prophecy was the Antichrist and the ten horns, or those ten nations that will be with him, declared that they cannot, he cannot carry out his objecti objective until Babylon the Great is destroyed. And that is supposed to take place before the second advent, or the second advent is when Jesus comes back with the church and he steps foot on the, on the earth for the Battle of Armageddon. It should, it should happen somewhere, maybe in, in the, in, in the, close to the end of the, of the, the um, tribulation. Now, watch me carefully now. Mammon is in direct contrast to the Spirit of God. Mammon says, buy and keep it. God says, sow and reap it. Mammon says, cheat and steal. God says, give and receive. Mammon is looking for servants, and it wants to rule your life and take the place of God. Remember, Mammon was this Syrian god of riches, and Babylon was a city that was given over to the spirit of Mammon with all of its greed and avarice, it's almost hard to trust anything that's said in this nature, in this nation, because you know it's mammon-driven. That it's motivated that somehow, some way, money's behind it. Even if it has to release something to kill people, let's just keep quiet. We made our money. It costs more to get medicine in this country than it does anywhere in the world. You wonder, in some nations, they give free education, 
they give, I think we left a country where they give, uh, they take care of your health, uh, it's, it's free, ain't nobody paying to go to the doctor or nothing like that. They will turn you out to die if you don't have the money to, be, to receive the services here. Things that were mammon-driven. Slavery was mammon-driven. What could make another human being enslave another human being and say they're less than a human being because they got different color? White folks got different color too if they go to Florida and stay for a while versus those who in, in Alaska. But what was driving force? What was the driving force behind slavery? Cotton was big business. Mammon. Mammon. I don't see why every state can't take their state university and offer free education to people that live in that state. When are we going to impart into our people? No, we can't do that. We got to get paid. Mammon driven. A propaganda that's going out nationwide, messing people's mind up. But at the end of it, what's the motivation? Mammon, money takes care of us. And even some churches got involved in it. I'll do anything to get the money. Even continue with a lie about giving as long as it doesn't affect my bag. You know the risk? It wasn't really a risk because God told me to do it. To talk about and teach tithing, it didn't bother me because God was the one that was going to be my source. But people who didn't know God as their source, it scared the lights out of them. For a man with this big of a microphone to tell people that under the New Testament, God is asking for you to give a generous offering and not 10 percent. Do you, do you understand the devils that went crazy? Mammon said, oh my God, he's trying to mess with our money in the church because a lot of things that's done in the church are money driven. Look at Luke 16, 13. Mammon is looking for servants. It wants to rule your life. It wants to take the place of God. Mammon wants you to crown it the idol of your life and to give it more value, that you trust that money more than you trust your God. And that's why it's always hard to give because you're like, wait a minute, I don't trust God. This real right here. So Jesus said here, he said, no servant can serve two masters. Two masters? I only know one. For either he will hate the one or he'll love the other or else he'll hold to the one and despise the other. And then he identifies the two masters that you can give value to. I was shocked when I saw this. Yea, he said, ye cannot serve God. He didn't say money and mammon. You're going to serve the God of mammon or you're going to serve the God of grace who is well able to take care of you. Mammon is selfish. God is generous. Mammon tries to take God's place by promising us everything that only God can give. Only God can give you real security, but mammon will try to give you security. And you think your security is in the money. And mammon's setting you up to try to disappoint you because you, 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 you're thinking your security is in money. 
And when it fails and when it falls, and there's prophecy about money failing, when it fails and when it falls, if you don't value God's provision more than mammon, he's going to say, I fooled you. Mammon wants you to think that it can take God's place and, and provide for you significance. Only God can give you real significance. Mammon wants you to think that money can give you real identity. Only God can give you real identity because I know people with a lot of money and they still don't have more identity. Mammon wants you to think that you have power when you have money. And for most of this world, they, they govern the power based on the amount of wealth that somebody has. But war, when you get sick of a cancer that they ain't got no cure for, only God will show that he has the power to do what your money can't do. Money can buy you a house, but it can't buy a home. Money can buy you medicine, but it can't buy you healing. Money might be able to buy you a little friend for the night, but it can't buy you an intimate, loving, lifelong partner. Only God can do that. Money wants you to think that you have real freedom when you have financial freedom. And everything paid for, and you still a slave to some substance that you're abusing in the back room of your mansion. Money is not our security. God is our security. In the last days, the love of money, preparing you to be a part of the community of Babylon the Great. I ain't doing it. I'm going to trust God. You put me in jail, I'm going to trust God. I've already been there. I'm going to trust God. I'm trusting God. You got to make your mind up right now. See, it's easy to come play church, but now we're getting down to the nitty-gritty. But for, for, for real Christians, those who, who I, I am, I'm, money, money will never, never take God's place. I'd rather give it all away. And that's what keeps Taffy and I in the right position, y'all giving. Anytime I'm scared to give a certain amount, I give that plus because you will not govern my life. You will not govern my life. If there's a car I've loved too much, I get that car away. If there's a house I fell in love with, I get that house away. I'm not going to be married to stuff. I'm not going to be married to money. I don't want nothing that I can't give when God tells me to give it away.